Hello, this is Bill Worrell with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Welcome to today's edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest. Hey everyone, my name is Wally Smith and I'm an Associate Professor of Biology at UVA WISE. And we are here on the banks of the Clinch River in St. Paul, Virginia today to talk about the Eastern Hellbender, which is one of our most unique amphibians here in Virginia and the Central Appalachians. And it's the animal that I'm holding here. And I'll preface my remarks first by pointing out that this is a scale model of a hellbender. This is not a live hellbender. Uh, we're here in January, so it's not the time of year to find these animals out and about. But I thought I would kind of show this animal first to give you a feel for what hellbenders look like. You maybe heard them under the name water dog or grampus, depending on where you grew up in southwest Virginia, if you're from this part of the state. But they're really charismatic animals, very special animals. I want to talk first about what makes hellbenders so unique. The first and most obvious thing that you can probably tell just from looking at this animal here is that hellbenders are huge for an amphibian and a salamander especially. They are the largest salamander in Virginia, one of the largest salamander species in the world, and are very different from the salamanders that you might be used to finding in something like a small headwater stream or a forest. Typically those animals, if you flip over a rock or a log and find a salamander, tend to only be a few inches in size, whereas hellbenders can get upwards of one to two feet in length. So this actually is a scale model of what one of those hellbenders could look like. So they're huge, that makes them unique right off the bat. And then also their habitat is very unique. The rivers like you see behind me with the Clinch River, uh, the New River, some of the, the tributaries of the Tennessee River beyond the Clinch here in Southwest Virginia, those are where hellbenders call home. And that again is very different from what you tend to think of when you consider where salamanders typically live. Hellbenders don't live in hardwood forests, they don't live in some of those smaller headwater streams, isolated wetlands where many of our other salamanders live. And instead, they like the clear, cool, well-oxygenated waters that you tend to find in some of our larger streams and rivers. Beyond that as well, hellbenders tend to live beneath boulders and large rocks and rock slabs at the bottom of some of these rivers. So it's totally possible to be floating over the top of a hellbender in a stream, maybe fishing uh, around a hellbender in a stream and never know that they're there but in streams that are pretty healthy, there could still be hellbender populations hanging on. In addition to one other thing that makes the hellbenders unique is what they do under those rocks. They tend to live beneath those boulders, but they also reproduce there, and hellbenders kind of flip the script reproductively of how we tend to think about animals reproducing, meaning that hellbenders are gonna lay their eggs underneath those rocks, but instead of having the female or maybe a combination of the parents caring for those offspring and the eggs uh, while they're under those rocks, the males in hellbenders tend to actually take care of those eggs and the female will leave after she lays those eggs under a nest rock. So that again makes them very distinct from a lot of the other salamanders that we have in this part of the world. And then finally one other thing that makes hellbenders special is that the story of hellbenders conservation wise is very tightly linked to the story of us as humans here in central Appalachia. And what I mean by that is if you've been around maybe 150, 200 years ago, uh, here in the Upper Tennessee River Valley or the New River Valley, some of the Ohio River tributary streams up to my north here uh, in southwest Virginia, you probably could have found hellbenders in most of those streams. Those hellbender populations probably would have been pretty healthy. Unfortunately though, as European settlers moved in and then especially after that as human populations increased, we tended to do a number on the water quality in a lot of our streams through uh, things like unsustainable timbering that happened very early on uh, in our history here, things like surface mining that are continuing today, even things like road building and commercial development. All of those things tend to impact water quality, especially through the contribution of sediment, things like mud and silt that eventually make their way into some of these larger streams. And that unfortunately has hurt hellbenders in a couple of ways. One of those is that increased sediment in a waterway tends to decrease the oxygen levels that the hellbenders need to survive. And then most importantly, a lot of that mud and silt, the sediment, tends to fill those spaces beneath the rocks that the hellbenders have to have to survive. So today, instead of finding hellbenders in most any stream, there are some estimates that suggest that maybe 80%, 90%, even more of the historic hellbender populations across their range have declined. And that's certainly the case here in Southwest Virginia. Our hellbender populations that we still have are not doing too well. And so what we want to do today is talk about uh, the work we're doing here in Southwest Virginia to try to better understand hellbenders and also discuss some ways that landowners, members of the general public can help us and the hellbenders out. Hi, I'm Melanie Carter and I am a private lands engineer. I work with Virginia Tech Conservation Management Institute and um, I work with a team that uh, what we do is stream restoration, um, also you know riparian land restoration, for uh, improving hellbender habitat. Um, you know, one of the 
uh, things that you can do, uh, like Wally said about sedimentation is probably has the biggest impact on hellbender habitats. And there's many things that we, um, that private landowners can do, that we can work with private landowners to help them as well. Um, one of the most essential things is making sure you have vegetation on your stream banks. Um, woody vegetation really locks those soils in and prevents erosion, so we can keep sediment out of the waterways um, really well with vegetation. Um, we also do stream restoration as far as addressing um, overwidened channels and channels that can't effectively carry their sediment. Um, we can use structures, in-stream structures with rocks and logs to um, improve uh, sediment transport, but also improve directly um, hellbender cover habitat. Um, another thing that we do um, with some of our projects is we actually put in um, cover and nest rock configurations. And um, our team has really been collecting a lot of data in reference streams where we know we have hellbenders and actually measuring existing habitat and trying to get that into um, rivers and streams uh, near where we know hellbenders are located. Um, I guess uh, one opportunity we have is uh, private landowners can work with Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, they have funding for forest landowners, ag landowners, um, that can do some of this restoration work through their environmental uh, quality incentive program. Um, so uh, contact your local NRCS office or um, Soil and Water Conservation District office and they can help you um, if you're interested in restoration work. So in addition to having a really unique life history and being a large salamander to begin with and living kind of in a unique habitat with major rivers and streams, hellbenders are also a really old lineage of salamanders. They're in the family Cryptobranchidae, which is a mouthful to say. We call those the Cryptobranchids for short. That is the giant salamander family that includes the hellbenders and also some relatives in Asia. There are some, hellbender, or some salamanders in Asia that actually get larger than hellbenders even do, even though our hellbenders here tend to be pretty large. And that family of salamanders is really unique because it's been around a very long time. Uh, some estimates in the fossil records show members of the giant salamander family being around uh, as far back as 100, 150 million years ago, which means that around the time of the dinosaurs, even before some of the later dinosaurs that we had, at least the ancestors of hellbenders and some of their modern day relatives were here on Earth. So it's a very, very old group of animals. In addition as well, we think when we look at the fossil record that hellbenders and their relatives have not changed that much over time. So when you see the morphology, the, the phenotype, we call it the physical appearance of hellbenders today, they really preserve this very ancient lineage and this ancient body type, we would call it biologically, of how a lot of the salamanders possibly, you know, back near the age of the dinosaurs looked, at least the members of this family. And that again kind of makes the story of hellbenders even a little bit more tragic because today we're seeing this very precipitous decline in these animals just over, you know, a few decades to a couple of centuries. And when you consider that these are representatives of a group of animals that have been around for 100, 150 million years, we really need to do everything we can to make sure that we keep these animals around. They're kind of almost a relic of the very ancient, very historic groups of animals that we used to have here, not just in Appalachia, but across the whole world. So that again is something that kind of makes hellbenders and their relatives and their taxonomic family uh, very distinct and very unique from some of the other amphibian groups that we currently have here. We know we've been talking today about um, why water quality is so important to hellbenders and why specifically preserving water quality can be so important. And one of the questions that can kind of come out of that is when you think about a little bit of mud or silt or sediment going into a stream, and you might think, what's the big deal? It's just a little bit of mud in the water and it's going to eventually wash downstream. But it's important to remember that sediment, even beyond other pollutants, can be a really big deal for hellbenders and a lot of aquatic life because a lot of times that sediment does not just simply float downstream. Instead, it can fill what we call the interstitial spaces or the voids or the spaces beneath rocks and between rocks on the stream bottom. And when you think about hellbenders living beneath those rocks, raising their young beneath those rocks, even younger hellbenders will get down in some of the gravel and the cobble at the bottom of the stream. 
If you fill those spaces up with sediment, you're effectively taking away the habitat that those animals have to have to survive. And it doesn't take very much sediment filling those spaces over a short period of time to begin to wipe out some of the habitat physically that those hellbenders need to survive. And hellbenders kind of in that sense are almost a canary in the coal mine when it comes to water quality and stream health, because it's not just hellbenders that are gonna live in that stream. We're gonna have freshwater mussels, uh, there are some sensitive fish species that occur in our streams as well. Uh, invertebrates also, they're going to live down in those spaces between rocks. So hellbenders tend to disappear pretty quickly when their habitat disappears. If you begin to see their populations decline, that can usually be kind of like a warning flag that you're also going to begin to see some of the other species that can be also sensitive to sediment and other pollutants in the stream decline as well. And beyond that, if you've got chemical pollutants beyond sediment washing into a stream, hellbenders are going to be stuck in place under those rocks. They're going to bathe in those chemicals. Their skin, like other amphibian skin, tends to be pretty porous and so chemicals go very quickly from the surface of the skin into the bloodstream of that animal. So beyond even the sediment issues, some of the other problems that we've talked about with physical habitat disturbance, if you have chemical pollution coming in on top of that sediment, that can kind of be a one-two punch for hellbenders and really lead to some quick declines in their populations. So it's important to remember that, you know, how we're using the land, the sediment that runs off of that land going into the streams, all of that is linked, especially when it comes to these animals that live in these habitats where they can't just pick up and move if their habitat gets disturbed. And that's one of the reasons why water quality Quality tends to be so important for hellbenders and especially hellbender conservation. So one of the questions that we often get about eastern hellbenders is where exactly they live and where you can expect to find them either in Virginia or other parts of the eastern U.S. And for the most part, eastern hellbenders are predominantly going to be an Appalachian species. So you're going to find them in the mountain rivers, some of the larger streams that flow into those rivers here in the mountains. In Virginia, you're going to find them predominantly in the upper Tennessee river drainages. So uh, the Clinch watershed, the Powell watershed, the Holston uh, watershed as well. Those are historically places where hellbenders have occurred. Uh, the New River Valley and the New River watershed contains those as well. And then also we don't know necessarily if they're still there currently, but historically uh, the Big Sandy River tributaries, some of the Ohio River tributaries, uh, the Russell Fork, the Pound River, some of the streams up in that part of the state, likely also historically at least had hellbenders as well. And beyond Virginia, you typically find them in those upper Tennessee River uh, drainages, some of the Ohio River uh, tributaries, all the way down into parts of North Georgia and extreme northern Alabama, at least historically again, that's where you tended to find hellbenders occurring. Today though, due to the decline in hellbender populations, you don't find them across that entire range. Really good healthy hellbender populations tend to be pretty spotty in terms of where you're going to find them. And unfortunately, a lot of the populations that we do still have hanging on are not doing too well. Uh, you may have some older individuals there that are not as reproductive. So you don't have a growing population, you don't have a healthy population. But uh, again, historically, the Appalachian region is predominantly where you're going to find them. You don't find them as much in the Piedmont, the coastal plain. The habitat is just not too good there. Uh, those areas tend to also be outside of the watersheds where hellbenders occur. So again, if you're in Appalachian parts of Virginia, especially far southwest Virginia, that really is ground zero in this part of the state where hellbenders are going to be. Uh, another neat kind of tidbit about the, the social science of hellbenders is we found over the years here in southwest Virginia, a lot of people historically did not grow up calling hellbenders hellbenders in this part of the state. Instead, there's some really colorful and kind of unique colloquial names that people will use for the species. Uh, my personal favorite that you hear a lot of times online and in news articles is snot otter because the hellbenders tend to be slimy. They live in rivers just like otters do, so they've kind of adopted that name. But we've actually found here in southwest Virginia there's a really neat geographic divide in what people call hellbenders depending on where you were born or where you live. In this part of the state, hellbenders go under different names. And as an example of that, here in the Clinch watershed where I'm standing today, uh, parts of the Powell River watershed as well, we found that people predominantly historically here have called hellbenders water dogs. So if you show a photograph of a hellbender to someone here and talk about it being a hellbender, you'll usually get corrected. And people will say, oh no, that's a water dog. That's what we called them growing up. If you move up to parts of the Ohio River tributaries, so places like the Big Sandy River, the Russell Fork, uh, Dickinson and Buchanan County, we found a lot of people out there call hellbenders Grampus, which again is another really cool, uh, kind of colorful name for the species. So it again just shows how hellbenders are really strongly tied to the people of the region. And it's just important to know that if you do have hellbenders in a stream, they're a great indicator of healthy water quality. They're not going to impose any restrictions on your use of the land if they do occur 
in a waterway where you live. But anything you can do to protect those animals helps to keep them around, helps to be a conservation benefit to those animals and can help make sure that we help the hellbender uh, recover in places where it's not doing so well and then also stay intact in some of those rivers where the populations are still there. Adult hellbenders primarily feed on crayfish and occasionally eat a small bottom dwelling fish. As juveniles, they are known to eat a variety of aquatic invertebrates. I want to thank the experts who made today's video possible. Dr. Wally Smith at the University of Virginia's College at Wise and Dr. Melanie Carter with the Conservation Management Institute at Virginia Tech. Additional information was obtained from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources webpage. Thank you for joining me for today's video.